Well, good morning, uh, early risers. Um, and I'm delighted to, to be here to uh, give this lecture and must thank the uh, college for uh, asking me and the association. Now, Sir William McEwen uh, was uh, one of Britain's uh, most distinguished surgeons in the l late 19th, early 20th century. So you can get a, an idea of which way I'm going to be voting in the uh, election later this year. He's a surgical innovator, a follower of Lister. He's one of the first uh, surgeons to successfully operate in the brain, draining a, a cerebral abscess and for the patient to live. And he was also an experimental biologist with a particular interest in the musculoskeletal system. So I feel it's particularly appropriate that uh, I'm giving this lecture with a focus on uh, muscle. What I'd like to cover this morning is just a, a, a brief review of muscle physiology, compare sarcopenia with cachexia, think about mass, muscle mass versus function, look at uh, muscle wasting in surgical oncology as an example of how important for surgeons skeletal muscle actually is, uh, think about the mechanisms of wasting and the advances in molecular biology which have underlined our new understanding in this area, and then uh, point you in some new directions in terms of the possible therapeutics in this domain. Well, first of all, uh, muscle represents 40% of our body mass. So it's one of the most uh, major organs that we have. There are 600 muscles in the human body, and uh, the protein that constitutes muscle turns over at the rate of about 2% per day. So although it's a relatively slow turnover compartment, because of the mass of muscle in the body, it accounts for between 30 to 40% of uh, whole body protein turnover per day. So it, it's a very biologically important organ in terms of metabolism. So it acts as our uh, amino acid reserve for mobilization as required, but also plays a role in shivering thermogenesis, glucose homeostasis, particularly in relation to peripheral insulin resistance. And recently, we've also come to understand that the muscle is an endocrine organ and uh, secretes a whole variety of myokines which participate in tissue crosstalk, for example, between fat and skeletal muscle. The remarkable feature of muscle is its plasticity. And uh, we see that muscles grow between childhood and adulthood. And then... After the age of about 40, we lose about 1% of our skeletal muscle mass per year, and this develops into the sarcopenia of old age. Alternatively, we also recognize that muscle can respond to environmental stimuli uh, with a progressive increase in mass with uh, adequate nutrition and exercise. And this plasticity is provided by a variety of mechanisms, including hypertrophy and hyperplasia, with some contribution from the uh, satellite cells or stem cells within skeletal muscle, but also uh, alteration in the uh, uh, proportion of fibre tight within a muscle can alter its function, and then we ha also have the atrophy pathways, including apoptosis. So the clinical importance of skeletal muscle is really almost self-evident. We need muscle to breathe. We need muscle to express ourselves, to move around. We need muscles to work, to produce economic activity. And perhaps most importantly, from a medical viewpoint, it pro provides a protein and amino acid reserve uh, to allow and promote recovery. Now, I've already mentioned uh, uh, age-related sarcopenia, and uh, this is an important domain because uh, we're heading towards a situation where the number of over-80-year-olds will double 
over the next 20 years. So there's going to be an epidemic of age-related sarcopenia. The molecular mechanisms underlying this are not really terribly well understood, but suffice to say there are a variety of clinical phenomena that also contribute to this process. Whether or not we know the precise molecular mechanisms of sarcopenia, uh, we do know the clinical sequelae uh, of uh, progressive muscle wasting in older people, and this includes an 80% difficulty in kneeling down, 50% difficulty in climbing stairs, 40% difficulty in uh, doing home chores, and from a clinical viewpoint, increased hostile stays, increased uh, numbers of falls and hip fractures, and an increase in the prevalence of nosocomial infection. So sarcopenia alone is a major target now for the pharmaceutical industry, just as osteoporosis was some 15 or 20 years ago. But let's turn now to disease-related muscle wasting, or cachexia. And what has this got to do with surgery? Well, you can see the uh, uh, man on the uh, left-hand side of the slide is visibly cachectic. Any clinician, any layman would be able to say, gosh, that man has tremendous wasting associated with pancreatic cancer. But what about uh, the lady in the middle who's undergoing her outpatient chemotherapy? Or what about the subjects on the other side with uh, uh, gross obesity? Are they cachectic? Well, in order to, to understand whether we can uh, detect cachexia in these individuals, we have to be able to readily measure muscle mass routinely. And until recently, this was something almost beyond comprehension in busy clinical practice. However, uh, we now recognize that underneath our very eyes has been the ultimate body composition tool for the last 20 years. And this is cross routine diagnostic cross sectional imaging. And we can take uh, as a scan, for example, this is at the L3, L4 uh, level in the abdomen. You can undertake planimetry of the muscle area in that uh, section, and that will give you about a 90% accuracy uh, estimate of whole body muscularity. And equally, you can look at sequential scans and look for differences in the muscle area in individual patients. So this is an extremely useful tool for undertaking routine body composition, and it is now readily available, certainly for research purposes. I think it's important, though, not to get too fascinated by body composition analysis without understanding that muscle function is also extremely important. Here's Mo Farah, Britain's greatest uh, Olympic athlete, perhaps, of all time. And before a race with his training, he'll lose 10% of his body weight, and he has a, a BMI of about 18. So by any clinical criteria, he is cachectic and yet its performance status is outstanding. So as well as measuring muscle mass, we always have to think about muscle function. Well, I now want to illustrate the, the problem of muscle wasting in modern uh, surgical oncology practice by uh, considering muscle wasting during neoadjuvant chemotherapy, its influence in the outcome of surgery, uh, the potential relationship to long-term oncological outcomes, and also the issue of chemotherapy toxicity. Well, sadly, it must be said that uh, most of our cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy in relation to their surgery are being dehabilitated rather than rehabilitated. And uh, in a recent study looking at serial CT scans of patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy for um, uh, esophagogastric cancer, we observed that there was a, a three kilogram loss of skeletal muscle during that period of chemotherapy. So that's a very significant loss of muscle mass 
uh, uh, during this treatment leading up to one of the most major operations that we could possibly do to somebody. And this is associated, if we attach an activity meter to the patient, we see that, in fact, there is a greater than 50% decline uh, in their physical activity during that time of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So they lose muscle mass and they lose gross levels of physical activity. A major impact on the quality of life of the patient. Now, the importance of this process is evidenced by the fact that there is a relationship between nutritional status and surgical outcome. And within traditional perioperative care, we see that, uh, for example, in this series from Canada, uh, low muscularity, myopenia, is related to increased post-operative infections, uh, an increased prevalence of the need for inpatient rehabilitation, and a prolonged length of stay. Now, there's been some one or two interesting uh, abstracts presented at this meeting which suggest that within perhaps an enhanced recovery pathway, nutritional status is less important in determining outcomes, but that's only because we've optimised the nutritional and metabolic care of the patients to allow that to the surgery to proceed with minimal stress. I think fascinatingly, uh, we, see it, we have recently observed that um, levels of muscularity at the time of diagnosis can predict the long-term survival of patients undergoing major cancer surgery. So uh, here is the um, overall survival of patients uh, following hepatectomy for hepatocellular carcinoma. And the red line are patients with uh, decreased muscle mass at the time of diagnosis. So low muscularity translates into uh, a reduced overall long-term survival. And equally, when we look at recurrence-free survival, this relationship holds. So there's something about having a low muscle mass that means that you are going to survive uh, uh, for a shorter duration after you've had uh, your tumour potentially resected. And I think that this, uh, there's data relating to this to a variety of tumour types. And it may be that it, this is relating to the phenotype of the tumour-inducing cachexia. It may be that, that it's due to the uh, toxicity that we see in relation to chemotherapy for patients who have myopenia. I'll come on to that in a minute. So I think it's important to realise that modern oncological treatment is not a single operation or a single episode of neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. Frequently now we see patients uh, having chemotherapy and in a variety of forms at a variety of times in their cancer journey, and they may have two or three or four uh, surgical procedures, including resection of their primary, resection of liver mates, or resection of lung mates, palliative surgical procedures, and so on and so forth. So that you can readily recognize that there is now a, the potential for a stepwise decline of the patients based on these interventions if we do not pay attention to their nutritional state, in particular, their level of muscularity. And as I mentioned, it's important to recognize that low muscularity not only may relate to poor outcomes from surgery, but may also relate to poor outcomes from chemotherapy. There's now a rash of publications showing that sarcopenia is an independent product predictor of severe toxicity during chemotherapy. We dose patients in surface area per meter squared, but we don't take account of altered body composition. And uh, the pharmacodynamics, uh, pharmacokinetics of uh, various chemotherapy drugs may be greatly altered in a patient with low muscularity. And we see this translating into increased toxicity, fewer cycles of chemotherapy completed, and maybe that partly explains the reduced overall long-term oncological outcome for patients with low muscularity. So it's uh, interesting that there are several new randomized trials in progress at the moment where the 
dose of chemotherapy is being based on body composition rather than body surface area. And the outcome of those trials will be very interesting. Well, I think it's important to recognise that um, muscle does not uh, exist in isolation and it also uh, exists in relation to the um, fat mass of a, an individual. And there is this crosstalk between fat and muscle and in fact perhaps the worst metabolic expression of muscle wasting is seen in the obese or overweight individual so-called sarcopenic obesity. And as you'll be well aware, there is an epidemic of obesity in Western society, particularly, for example, in North America. Now, normally an obese person, because they carry excess weight, has greater muscularity than a not obese person. But there is this subgroup of individuals who are obese but have gross muscle wasting. And for example, here is a group of advanced pancreatic cancer patients we looked at, uh, again with CT body composition analysis, and we showed that even in the group who had uh, uh, a BMI greater than 25, 40% of these individuals were sarcopenic. So the idea that a big fat person walks into your office and sits down and says, OK, I've got this cancer, I want this chemotherapy or this operation. You can't assume, because they do not look malnourished, that they, in fact, don't have gross underlying muscle wasting. And interestingly, when we looked at survival of this patient cohort and multivariate analysis, it was the combination of muscle loss and uh, obesity, excess fat mass, that was the most significant independent predictor of shortened survival. So sarcopenic obesity in cancer is very bad news, particularly, for example, in this group with uh, advanced pancreatic cancer. Well, what does uh, sclerotic muscle actually look like? And it's amazing that I've been studying this for 25 years, and it's only recently that we've been obtaining sufficient material muscle biopsies from patients to be able to characterize this uh, in a kind of rigorous way. But you can see in these scans that uh, on the uh, right-hand side is somebody with cancer cachexia from their uh, CT image of their leg, and the muscles are uh, reduced in size and infiltrated by fat. And this fat infiltration also affects the muscle at a microscopic level. We see on the EM images here these globules of fat accumulating in muscle. It's almost as if in cachectic muscle there is excess mobilization of whole body fat, and the, but the muscle is not able to utilize this fat adequately as an energy source. The reason for this fat accumulation is not readily understood, however, at the moment. Well, the mass of a muscle is determined by the uh, ratio of synthesis to uh, degradation, and the thesis to date has been, well, patients' muscles waste away because of either decreased synthesis or increased degradation. If we look at uh, uh, the degradation side of things for uh, human uh, data, the uh, prime candidate that we'd suggest might be increased in these patients causing muscle wasting would be activation of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway whereby individual proteins are tagged with ubiquitin for degradation in the proteasome. However, when we've looked at uh, uh, muscle biopsies from humans, you can see that there's a whole variety of observations here and that the human population is really quite heterogeneous. Some studies suggesting activation of the, this pathway and some not. Our most uh, recent information uh, is that there does not seem to be much activation of the UPP pathway, but in fact um, there may well be some activation of the lysosomal autophagy pathway in human skeletal muscle in patients with advanced cancer. And this is an interesting therapeutic target for the future. On the synthesis side, we have 
a, a warning here for those who are interested in looking at the transcriptome uh, as a way of metabolic interpretation, because we did this and uh, this suggested that maybe 1,800 genes were uh, regulated in cancer cachexia with a predominant reduction in genes associated with cell turnover and synthesis. And yet when we've looked at measured protein synthesis uh, in weight-losing cancer patients using stable isotope incorporation into myofibrillar protein, then we see there's no difference. So uh, there's quite a significant disconnect between the transcriptome and what's actually synthesized in the myotube. And this is a theme that applies not only to the cachectic process, but also to uh, sports medicine, where there is a disconnect between transcriptomics and proteomics. So uh, given the fact that uh, muscle protein synthesis does not seem to be suppressed, our most recent results suggest that part of the wasting process, perhaps not only in cachexia but also in sarcopenia, is the fact that the stem cells which help replace effete or damaged myotubes may be activated, but then there may be a block to their progressive differentiation. And this is an area of uh, ongoing research. Well, I just want to finish off by uh, a few words about the therapy of muscle wasting. And as I mentioned, this is a really exciting area because there's been recently about $800 million uh, invested by Big Pharma in finding a solution to uh, muscle wasting in various clinical conditions. And you can relate this to age-related sarcopenia. You can relate this to getting patients off a ventilator in ICU. You can relate this to maintaining patients during progressive surgery and uh, systemic chemotherapy programs. Now, I, I think it's important to appreciate here there are no magic bullets in uh, muscle wasting. There's no gain without pain. So the American dream is not here. And uh, we have to pay attention to the basics of muscle maintenance in terms of nutrition and exercise. And if we don't do that, then we're not going to see the benefit from the uh, adjuvant effect of these new powerful drugs. And I think it's important not to over-egg equally the potential benefit of improving muscle mass and function in clinical conditions. So that, for example, with uh, the management of sarcopenia in the elderly, we see that progressive resistance training can have a large effect in muscle strength. But in terms of translating into uh, an improved gait speed or six-minute walk test, the effects are moderate. And then when we look to the actual amount of physical activity that the patient undertakes, the effects may be quite small. So I think that when we think of rehabilitation pr programs, for example, in patients undergoing chemotherapy, we have to take a multimodal view of the problem of which improving muscle mass and function is one component. Uh, 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 and I think that's an important message for uh, investigators in the future. Well, the exciting research area uh, that's opened up over the last uh, five years or so is the recognition that, yes, we can get muscles to grow by pushing on the accelerator in terms of insulin, insulin-like growth factor one, testosterone, amino acids, particularly in leucine, uh, and our, our usual understanding of uh, the improvement with aerobic and resistance exercise. But equally, we now recognize that in adult humans, the reason our muscles don't get larger and larger from day to day is the fact that we have a natural break to the hypertrophy of muscles known as the myostatin system. 
So naturally, uh, one target then for uh, improving muscle mass and function is not only to push in the accelerator, but to take your foot off the brake, to inhibit the brake. And in the natural world, there's an example of this with the grossly over-muscled Belgian blue cow. And these cows have a loss of function mutation in their myostatin gene. And there are also clinical examples of grossly over-muscled children who have the same mutation. So uh, from the figure you can see that uh, myostatin or another agonist of the actar 2 b receptor, Activin, uh, acts through the uh, SMAD2 and FOXO3A transcription factor and can upregulate uh, the ubiquitin uh, ligases uh, MAFBOX1 and MRF, and uh, these can then initiate the ubiquitin proteasome pathway and degrade muscle. So that's going on all the time in your body. And the interesting thing is to then develop strategies for inhibiting this pathway to promote muscle growth. And you can do that either by an antibody to myostatin per se or an antibody to the receptor, the actor 2 b receptor. And uh, this has been done and published in Cell uh, two or three years ago, looking at a murine model of cancer cachexia, where an actar 2 b decoy receptor was shown to completely abrogate the development of cachexia in this murine model, and did this in the presence of progressive tumour growth. So here, for the first time, we were able to say, well, we can make the nutritional decline of the patient completely independent of whether their cancer is progressing or not. And this opens uh, the um, potential of improving survival of patients based on treatment of their cachexia as well as their optimal oncological management. Well, I've just uh, had time to address one of these uh, new therapeutic uh, uh, tools, which are now in phase two and phase three trials. We have these trials ongoing in the UK at the moment um, in terms of antimyostatin strategies. There are also uh, so-called SARM, selective antigen receptor modulators, which can readily put on two kilograms of lean body mass in a period of eight weeks. Uh, Anti-interleukin-6 uh, antibodies, uh, humanized antibodies are now readily available that can completely abrogate the systemic inflammatory response in patients with advanced cancer. And there are uh, recent uh, large phase three trials being conducted and coming to an end with the uh, ghrelin analog anamorelin, uh, which not only significantly stimulates appetite uh, in patients, but also via its IGF-1 stimulatory effects can markedly increase lean body mass over a period of six or eight weeks. So within the next two or three years, we, rather than thinking that the cupboard is empty in the therapy of muscle wasting beyond simple exercise and nutrition, we are soon going to be faced with a whole variety of possibilities in treating muscle wasting actively in our patients. And I think it will be a really fascinating time to see how we integrate these potential therapeutic interventions into regular practice to improve surgical outcomes. So in summary, I just uh, would like to emphasize that loss of muscle impacts at every step, particularly of the cancer journey. Muscle mass can be measured routinely now on cross-sectional Im cross imaging and is no longer a mystery. And that these new, very powerful, targeted therapies based on our understanding of the molecular biology of muscle wasting open a new era for active intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you.